We're back on the Sportsmax Zone to the Hero Caribbean Premier League. That's set to start in Trinidad and Tobago on the 18th of August. And it ends on the 10th of September. That's when the final will be played. All matches to be played at the Queen's Park Oval and the Brand Lara Cricket Academy in Taruba. And Sportsmax, your home of champions, will have live coverage of the matches, the competition's most successful franchise. Trinidad, uh, the Trinbago Knight Riders, they have named Kyron Pollard as captain for the season. Now, Pollard stood in for the injured skipper Dwayne Bravo last year, and a TKR CEO, Venki Mysore, says Bravo has accepted the decision. Here's what Mysore says. The champion, DJ Bravo, has been coming to me year after year and asking me to give someone else a captaincy because he wants to just concentrate on playing and enjoying the game. I always told him, not until I'm ready, and that time has come, and he is very happy to play under Pollard. Mariah, well, that's your team. That's my team. That's your team as well. So, um, Trinbago Knight Riders, Pollard, I expected this. I expected um, DJ Bravo to be very comfortable playing under Karen Pollard because I remember when the when Bravo got his injury last season and the first name that came up we all know the relationship between Bravo and Pollard it's public you know they get along very well and even though Bravo couldn't have played he was at the matches game after game you know talking to the players um, reminding them to support Pollard you know just being there with the team so I know this is a decision that will definitely be well received well up whether Pollard is the captain or Bravo is the captain I think they'll work together and gel just as they normally do as a very um, a unit that works together. Mm. So I have, no, I, I have full confidence in my captain. Yeah, the new West Indies white ball captain, of course, Kyron Pollard, and uh, he is confirmed as a captain. As we said, you know, uh, Bravo had a finger injury just before yes. the start of last year's tournament. Uh, do you think Polly is a better captain than Bravo, George? Oh yes, for sure. Uh, he's a superior captain to DJ Bravo. The thing is this, a guy like DJ Bravo, he needs to be enjoying himself and he would have seen the captaincy as a burden, but because he's a thoroughly good, he's a thoroughly top professional, he wouldn't say, you know, he, he wouldn't, ha after having accepted the captaincy, acted in a manner to, to suggest that the captaincy was a burden. But you heard my source say that he kept coming to me year after year saying, can't you find someone else to give that this burden to? Let me be my full self. You know, there's a word that was used to describe Larry Constantine years ago. And if you read certain books of a certain era, if you, if you, if you, if you read the writings of, for instance, uh, C.L.R. James, uh, the, 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 the legendary Caribbean man of history, he's, he was more than an author. He was an institution by himself, C.L.R. James. And even if you read the autobiography of Sir Frank Worrell and the impact of Larry Constantine, there's a word that every time I see that word, I only think of Larry Constantine because I think it sums him up very well. It's called ebullient, E-B-U-L-L-I-E-N-T. That word is, is, is describing a character who is big, uh, someone whose personality and character are always on display, someone who believes confidently in themselves. Not someone who is obnoxious, but someone who people love having around, someone right. who is the life of the party, someone if they are a performer, they are the star performer, they accept the responsibility of performing for the audience that they have and performing to good effect for the benefit of their teammates. I would extend that, and I'm not comparing DJ Bravo to Larry Constantine people, but I'm saying it is in the same mode. So I'm sharing. When I see a bullion, I think of Larry Constantine and I think of DJ Bravo. For a character like that, I think it is best not to have him weighed down by the anchor of the captains. And the captains can feel like an anchor at time to time. You can ask uh, uh, Pollard. Last season, the TKR looked as if they were going to sweep the CPL until the captains became an anchor and they fell, uh, to, fell late in the competition and were out of contention. So I'm saying I think it's the right decision. Allow DJ Bravo to be free and to do his magic on the field with bat and especially with ball and leave the captaincy to the man who was built for it, Polly, Karen Pollard. Yeah, I agree with that, um, Polly. He, he has a career that has been steeped in T20 success as well. Yeah. Um, he has won, I think, three IPL titles with the Mumbai, Mumbai. Indians and so on. So um, Polly is a, a solid white ball captain and Caribbean Premier League cricket suits him well. And he has been a leader for previous teams before TKR. Uh, let's wish him and the TKR the best of luck. 
Best of luck, TKR. Continuing now, former West Indies batsman Phil Wallace says the lack of aggression of West Indies captain Jason Holder was one of the main reasons why the team lost the Wisden Trophy to England. Speaking on the Mason and Guest show, Wallace said, if you look at the second and third match and how he handled it again, we see deficiencies in his aggression. I don't think he's aggressive enough. I don't think he's aggressive enough. When Ben Stokes decided to come around the wicket, we saw things change. We didn't see a lot of aggression from our captain and that's why bowlers did not show the aggression. So Lance, I start with you. We heard our Wallace's comments over there. Do you think Jason Holder is not aggressive enough? And do you think you need an aggressive captain to get the best out of a team? In many instances, yes, I think you do need that. And uh, let me say generally that I don't think Jason Holder is an aggressive individual. So there are times when he is on the field, his body language may not exude aggression. So um, tactically, Philo Wallace is suggesting from a strategic standpoint, he saw points in, in the game where he could have been a little bit more aggressive. I don't think aggression is part of Jason Holder's acumen or his, his, his character or his personality. Um, I would agree that there are times a captain has to be aggressive. Having said that, I, I, do, I would not criticize Jason Holder's lack of aggression as the reason why the West Indies lost this series. George. So I, I hear Philo's points, but I think the team played really badly in the second and third test matches. And I think, it, if, in my opinion, it's unfair to lay that blame on Holder's lack of aggression. Question. If Joe Root, from the second test forward, so the second and third tests, mm -hmm. if Joe Root had the Windy's bowling lineup at his disposal, what would he have done? Would he have handled them in the same way? The answer is no, because it's not the same bowling lineup. I think that has a lot to do with how aggressive a captain can appear to be with his tactics and the tactics that he asks his bowlers uh, to, 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 to bowl to, to or to use to deploy in trying to unsettle a batsman, of course, trying to dislodge a batsman, trying to get a batsman out. And so when you have charge, when you have command, of course, Archer was, was missing from the second test, but you had Broad, you had Wokes, you had uh, Jimmy Anderson, you had Ben Stokes available in the second test. Then, then, then oh, sorry, Jimmy Anderson was, was, as my producer likes to say, rested. He was dropped for the second test. He was recalled for the third test. So Jimmy Anderson in the, in the third test, Archer not in the second test, but in the third test, and Chris Wokes in both of those tests. If you had those bowlers to call on, how would you deploy them? So I see what Philo Wallace is saying, but perhaps, Philo, you are not giving enough allowance or making enough allowance for the fact that Jason didn't have the same bowlers as Joe Root did. And more crucially than that, the bowlers that Joe Root would send to go around the wicket, and you're not going around the wicket only to bowl fast, but you're going to make it awkward, and if you can get bounce, it's even worse for the backspin coming from a different angle that they're used to and the, the bounce that they're going to get. One of your main strike bowlers, Shannon Gabriel, dodgy uh, from after the first test. So in the second test, you wouldn't want to cause Shannon to go out of his comfort zone, especially if he was bowling in such a manner that he could be useful to you for over a longer period. You, want, you wouldn't want to risk sending him around the wicket to ask him to do something that could perhaps ag aggravate anything that he was nursing at the time. So I'm saying I understand the point that Philo is making and I, and, I, and I see why he has made the observation and the criticism, but I think that given the tools that Holder had, he didn't show the aggression that Wallace would have wanted. And then by nature, Jason Holder is not an aggressive guy. So if we're going to talk about Jason Holder not being aggressive in the second and third tests, I think it would be more accurate to say Jason Holder has never been an aggressive captain a day in his life leading the West Indies. Definitely. Well, Wallace, he was also highly critical of Holder's continuing support for Shea Hope. Obviously, when Jason decided to continually defend Hope, it's a massive statement to defend a man who hasn't scored runs in test match cricket for a long time. Yet you have the extra batsman available to you and you did not play him. You went down the road with Shea Hope and Shea Hope did not deliver for you. So that is a massive responsibility for a captain to take on board. Lance, I start with you because of mm. course that Shea Hope selection was a constant discussion on the Sportsmax zone. 
Yeah, well, Shea Hope didn't deserve his place in this West Indies team, especially in the third test, because at that point, um, he had already had two test matches to, to turn his form around, and the third test now was the pivotal test match. So based on his numbers, he didn't deserve to be in the team. Having said that, he wasn't the only batting failure in the series. There were several batting failures in the series. In fact, Jermaine Blackwood was the leading batsman in the series, and his batting average for the series was only 35. So we had real problems with batting. John Campbell? His batting average was Constant. 14, 15. It, yeah. was, it was poor. So Shea Hope was one of several batsmen who failed to deliver. But because his failure has been happening now for three years, obviously the spotlight is on him. And uh, it is obvious that he didn't deserve his place in the team. And, you know, people were just going on what they know he can do or he has done in the past. And he was given the opportunity. Um, Wallace is saying that Shea Hope was, was that Jason Holder was there standing behind him, but I suspect that the coach was behind him as well. If, 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 if it is that um, Shea Hope was not given an opportunity to play in the, the last test match, or the fact that he was given the opportunity to play in the last test match, I'm not sure if it is Jason Holder and Jason Holder alone who would have made that decision. And that's the thing, when um, Phil Wallace comes out and makes comments like this, it looks as if, you know, Jason Holder is the only one to be held accountable. George, on the zone, you brought, you know, all your statistics and you came out talking about um, Shea Hope. How did this, um, how did you feel when you heard Phil Wallace's comments about Shea Hope's selection? Well, Phil Wallace is, is, is correct to a point. I would say that the difficult thing for leaders to do is to criticize players in public, to slate players in public. Some people like that. Some people like when they say someone is a straight talker. But when you have to manage a group dynamic and when you have to ensure that the same players that you will slate publicly, you're going to have to go to them in private and in practice and ask for their cooperation and their help. It's a difficult thing. And so maybe Jason Holder spoke good words about Shea Hope in public. And of course, one would expect that he batted for him at the selection meetings that they were having, it has proven to be wrong. And we all knew that Shea Hope had got more than enough chances. So I, I agree with Philo to an extent, but I also can identify with, Shea, with uh, Jason Holder not talking down his player in public, especially a player who in ODI cricket is one of the best batsmen in the world, potentially should be very good, or at least good, at test level, but he's not coming through. And if you know that he's going to be a part of your team, then you're not going to come on the eve of the team and say anything negative about him because you want to coax a yeah. good performance out of him. And I know if Phil Wallace were in the same position as Jason Holder, he would have perhaps said the same things about Shea Hope and left a commentator to say you were too <laughs> kind to Shea Hope. That's how the world runs. Definitely. So, of course, former Windy's batsman, Phil Wallace, you know, talking about Jason Holder, saying he wasn't very aggressive as a captain, and, of course, commenting on Jason Holder's decision to continuously support Shea Hope. We go to break and we come back.